Christians and Jews worship the same God, share parts of the same Bible, and in fact claim Jesus in different ways. We'll be talking with Rabbi David Stern about some of those similarities and differences on Good God. Stay tuned. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm George Mason, your host, and I'm thrilled to have back on the program with us today uh, Rabbi David Stern, my good friend and the senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel. Uh, David, um, we, we got started in some fascinating conversation in the last episode, and I think it'd be fun to turn it to the theological uh, right. just now. So uh, we've, we've talked about the sociological somewhat, we've talked about religious liberty and uh, the place of our religious communities in, in society and how we are trying to navigate identity versus relevance, yeah. Um, yeah. those sorts of things. This has always been true in our biblical tradition and in our communities over time as we've tried to be faithful. Um, but uh, we both, uh, share uh, part of the Christian Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible being, of course, our Old Testament. Uh, let's just talk about some of these things that we have both in common and different from one another okay. so that people can realize uh, instead of making uh, grand gest uh, conclusions, I might say, yeah. about, you know, the Old Testament God is this and Jews believe that, they're, you know, legalists and we're full of grace and, right. you, you know, typical right. things right. that we, we talk right. about. Right. So, the Hebrew Bible is uh, what we call the Old Testament. When you hear us use language of Old Testament, what happens in your mind? In a way, it's become such sort of lingua franca yeah. in the English language and in the American yeah. context that it doesn't really disturb that much. We mm -hmm. don't encourage that language in our own community because, as you well know, the notion of Old Testament implies the existence of a new and superseding testament. This is a very important word, supersession, which is to say that after Jesus, Christians came along and became the real Israel because the old Israel, Jews who persist in the old Israel, are really part of what failed. Correct. And, and therefore, the new community was brought to pass and we are it. Right. Would you want the old Rice Krispies or the new Rice Krispies, exactly. as we like to say? Right, right. 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 Yeah. So, um, so we call it ends up being, of course, reverse definition. So we always say, well, what Christians call the Old Testament, we call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. right. Um, and Hebrew Bible is sometimes used, as you've pointed out, Hebrew Bible is a little confusing sometimes when people are reading in English, and how is that the Hebrew Bible? Exactly. Meaning Bible of the Hebrews as opposed yes. to Bible currently being read in the Hebrew language. Right. The sort of internal Jewish communal word for it is Tanakh, um, which comes from a Hebrew acronym which names the three sections, Torah, Prophets, and Writings. Um, but that's an example of a Jew living in a non-Jewish world, even as it comes to how Jewish things are labeled. Yes, yes. So we have the problem historically, therefore, of, uh, of needing to figure out we have language of Old Testament and New Testament. How do we have a vital spiritual community that is connected to the uh, Hebrew tradition and ongoing connected to a vital living Jewish uh, faith without being supersessionist? Mm. This is part of our, our big challenge, mm. and we have failed through generations of mm. this over mm. and over again, mm. and it is yet uh, an important uh, thing for us to make. The challenge, I think, is flipped for you, right? And that is, what do we make of the presence of Christians mm -hmm. as uh, people who claim that they are linked up to our tradition, but they seem to be very different in the way that they express their faith? Uh, how do you wrestle with that? Uh, I think that the, 
The first, pl I'll give you a sociological answer first and then a theological answer. I think sociologically, the first thing that each of us is responsible for is making sure that our folks don't fall into some easy, lazy mm -hmm. denigration of the other, or even if it's not denigration, a sort of making the other a monolith, you know, yes. re a, for a Jew to reduce Christianity to a bumper sticker or vice versa. Right. Um, I think that's the first thing we're responsible for, is to just mm -hmm. consistently bring people into this complexity of theological relationship and not, not let them see us settling for. Yes that kind of lazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been part of the joy of this relationship for me is that we never settle for lazy stuff. Um, the, for me, um, I see Christianity as a development from Judaism that like all developments has to, to some extent, reject its forebear. Hmm. It has to. Hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't distinguish itself. And right. historians will argue over who does the distinguishing and exactly in which generation that happens and yes, of course. how that develops. And you know a lot more about that than I do. But, but I don't, I'm not offended mm -hmm. by that rejection because I see the rejection as necessary mm -hmm. to the development of this faith community that has brought tremendous gifts to the world. Yes. You and I have sometimes differed, and we haven't talked about it recently. Mm -hmm. You and I have sometimes differed about whether there can be these simultaneous truths or whether there is an ultimate truth and we'll find out in the great by and by, mm -hmm. right? But in the meantime, we should be humble enough to tolerate each other's truth claim, right? right? So those are two sort of different yeah. um, epistemological stances. One is there is an absolute truth but we are human beings and we only have partial access to it, right. so we should therefore act humbly. Yes. The other is that they may not be exclusive truth claims because they're by definition partial. Yes. Mm -hmm. Either of those, it seems to me, is a path to mutual growth and mutual understanding. Sure. Uh, as long as the absolute, the claim to absolute truth doesn't require that you have mine, uh, and not yours. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. You right. Know? It's right. still what we would call an eschatological truth. That is to Correct. say, yet to be revealed. And yes. so we are we're working toward that. And, and 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 that has to do with, you know, I think this sense that comes from monotheism generally, and that is reality is whole. You know, right. ultimately, yes, our experience of it is partial. Correct. But there is a wholeness uh, that we can depend upon and that uh, we, we believe is, is part of our vision of a broken world that is uh, being promised to be healed uh, in the end. I agree, and for me, and I'm not trying to speak for all, certainly not for all Jews or all rabbis or probably for my own whole family, but the, the, to me, the existence of God in and of itself, mm -hmm. to me, says, it gives me the blessing of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. In other words, my certainty that God exists, mm -hmm. because, and because God is the only supreme and God is the only unified and unifier, mm -hmm. my faith in God means that by definition, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not God, yes. right? So. You can see how diametrically opposed positions could come from the same conviction, right? right, right. Some could say, because God exists, I have certainty about every, about every sub-proposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. My position would be that because I believe in a God who is greater than any human being or any collection of human beings, because God exists, all sub-propositions are to me uncertain. Well, let's, let's root this back in the biblical tradition, all right? Let's go to... Um, the burning bush. Yep. All right. So here, God calls to Moses out of the bush, and Moses wants to know, wants to know who are you? Right. God retains subjectivity and the power of God's own name in delivering the tetragrammaton uh, that I am who I am, I am that I am, I will be who I will be, right. all of these sort of forms of the verb, yep. but this sort of 
behind that seems to me to be this idea of I'm going to retain the right of my um, knowledge of myself, and you don't need to know more than that I am. Uh, that and what I tell you to do. And what I tell you to do, exactly. Yeah. So being, so th there seems to be a history of this saying the name of God that goes out comes out of that, right? That right. It's presumptuous for us to say the name of God and some level of divine mystery is always retained. Right. So if that's true, because the ultimate truth and subjectivity is with God and not with us, then for us to claim certainty about things. Uh, about God, about the world, is uh, again presumptuous. That's that would be my take, and I think that the and you could root that anywhere. You could root, not anywhere, but you could root that. It, it, it's one of the many parallels between the burning bush and the revelation at Sinai. Mm -hmm. Right? What does it mm -hmm. mean that the people are kept at a distance? What does it mean that this happens right. in thunder and cloud? The mm -hmm. subsequent rabbinic interpreters argue about how much of the Ten Commandments the people actually heard directly, and how much was uh, moderated by Moses. Right. The, that to me is part of the beauty and excitement of the tradition is that recognition mm -hmm. because that allows for ongoing discovery and it insists on ongoing humility. I think we get where we get tripped up is when we take, when we translate what might be our faith in the certainty of God's existence into faith in the certainty of our own positions. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I we know in, in our own experiences, uh, preachers, that there is what we say and there is what people hear. Right, right. And are you going to claim that there is an objective word here that once spoken uh, is fixed? Or is it not dynamic in such a way that it meets people in different places and when they report on what they have heard, it doesn't come out always the same. It's a game of telephone. It's absolutely remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get this experience, I'm sure, afterward, you're greeting people. And, uh, you know, what you said about this really matters. Don't believe I said that. I'm really, I'm re <laughs> really struggling to remember, you know, how it might be that you're. That, that <laughs> it, 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 it's just different. So, right. uh, anyway, I just, um, I, I think that there's some part of that that significance there that um, we, we don't know fully what we're saying in an absolute sense, but there is this dynamic of the word that is, that is alive. And, uh, and, and so it doesn't disturb me that there are different reports of that at Sinai, or for example, at Jesus' baptism. Mm or on the Mount of Transfiguration. Or contrasting Gospels. Or contrasting Gospels. But there are reports, there was a voice from heaven, you know, and in one case, it, it was heard by everyone, and another by the disciples, and another just by Jesus, you know. Well, what, what, what was it? You know, well, yes. Well, and what that right. demands of us then, mm -hmm. because we then have to be ready to answer the question. Right. Well. David or George, if I'm not coming to you for certainty, yes. why am I coming? Right. If I'm not coming to you to te teach me the bright, clear line of this tradition, right. I, don't, I don't need to come to church for multivocality. What you do have to come to church for or to synagogue is uh, you need to be able to come to gain the capacity to live with uncertainty with confidence and faith and courage in, in, in the course of this life, right? And a community that supports you on that path. Right. That you're not walking that path alone. Right. And to be open to the wisdom that comes from humility and the discovery that comes from curiosity. Right. Because that's the other thing about certainty. Certainty right. precludes curiosity. Right, so it just shuts down. So why do I need to learn more? Because right. I already know. Right. You know, and that's a really dangerous thing. Uh, whether you are a, a, a minister, a rabbi, uh, a politician, uh, a scholar, once you know, mm -hmm. then you, you think you have the power uh, to act upon that in a way uh, that uh, loses humility 
and doesn't make room for growth and, and change still. Well, let's, let's pick this up after the break because I want to go back to the whole idea of truth and then relate it to Jesus as well, which is uh, it, it, one of the most important questions between Jews and Christians because we both have Jesus in common and uh, we have differences. So, Beautiful. all right, we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to tune in to Good God. This program is made possible by the contributions of friends of the program, and we are delighted that they continue to support it so generously so that we don't have to ask for additional support every episode. I'm sure you're glad about that too. If you'd like to know where else you can tune in to find Good God, whether in a video format or audio, or even to get a transcript of the program, go to www goodgodproject.com. That's our website, and it's the best place to go to receive an archive of all the previous episodes and to get a new one each week if you'd like. Thanks again for your support. We're back with David Stern. David, we uh, have together uh, been in dialogues before audiences in all sorts of places, here at Wilshire, at Temple, at a community college, at different places, right? And it, it's always interesting to me that we, we come up against a, a, a moment when people want to ask questions and it, 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 we always have to get to the difference we have over Jesus. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the question is as simple and straightforward as uh, someone in the Jewish community saying, do you think I'm going to hell because I don't believe in Jesus? Mm -hmm. right. So there is an, it, it, an important thing to say, and that is, you know, we have Jesus in common in the sense that uh, uh, he, he was always a Jew, never a Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that seems so obvious, but we, we lose that along the way. Uh, and, and yet we divide over the significance of who he is and his role uh, in uh, our traditions. Jesus said in one of the most uh, challenging passages, I think, for Jewish and Christian relationships, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this has been taken by Christians through the years to have been a point of departure. Uh, we've talked earlier about truth being provisional and all of that, here is Jesus saying, I am the truth. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Now, on the positive side, you can say, well, that's uh, what he's arguing there is that he, uh, it, it, that truth is personal and that uh, it, it can only be known in a kind of relational way and a following that is a, a matter of discipleship and uh, an and, and, and ethical uh, uh, path that is, is to be taken. But in another way, it's still challenging because it, it, it does speak to this Christian conviction that Jesus is uniquely uh, given by God a role to lead people to the life to come. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that text, uh, and you've heard it all through your, your life and ministry, what? What comes to your mind? How do you hear it with Jewish ears? Do you hear it mostly through the resonance of people arguing for an exclusivity as Christians, or do you hear it differently as a Jew uh, it, based upon what you know to be the resonance from Jewish tradition? I hear it mostly as rejection. Okay. As exclusion. All right. Now, I don't know, I don't, quiz my Christian friends as to whether that, how important that verse is to them, whether it's defining right. for them. Right. It doesn't feel ambiguous to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it feels very clearly a statement of, um, I am the way, mm -hmm. and folks have a choice as to whether they're gonna follow me as the way. Sure, sure. So I think that is the way it has been used, and it is, uh, also true that it comes in the Gospel of John, mm -hmm, which is right. the latest gospel yep. of the four. Right. The gospel wherein the, the 
conversation is really a, 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 a kind of wrestling with the fact that Jews who have believed in Jesus and those who did not put their trust in Jesus are having a family argument yep, here. Right. And so there is a justification going on for those Jews who believed in Jesus right. and making a universal claim about it. Uh, where in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not quite as clear about, about right. that. So I'll start there and say, yes, there is a sense of exclusivity that goes along with that gospel and that has a kind of anti-Jewish um, feel to it. Right. On the other hand, uh, when I read that text more deeply, what I hear is when it says, I am the way, the truth and the life, I hear not three things, mm. but one, mm. that is, mm. I am the true way of life. What is way mm. in, he, in Hebrew tradition? Mm. This Haggadah, mm -hmm. this, this pattern of the commandments that says, uh, my way of understanding this is uh, the true way mm. of understanding it, and if you follow in this way, way. Mm -hmm. you will experience the life that is so intended. Got it. That that God has given me uh, this role of being able to uh, embody this tradition in this way, and as such, there he is making claims that a rabbi might make, uh, clearly not as deferential as one might, but he was claimed to have been, who is this rabbi that speaks with such authority, right? Who, right. who, who does claim so much like that. So when I hear that, I hear it still rooted in the language of a Hebrew mindset, but it has then been abstracted into a post-Jewish world where it then becomes more about going to heaven when you die mm -hmm. than uh, being part of a community that uh, is being led to the age to come by this way of life. So it, it's, I think it's an interesting wrestling that we have to have as Christians when we read that text are we going to try to find the Hebraic mindset in it, or are we going to just move to the exclusive one? Well, and even with the best intent, my worry would be, I mean, you know, you and I have talked about this. It's some, some of it comes to how we read scripture. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. in the reform movement, can look at a verse mm -hmm. from the Hebrew Bible or from the New Testament and say, that verse reflects a certain place and a certain time, and it doesn't speak a timeless right. truth. Right. right. That's how I look at that verse. Of because course. I worry, and mm -hmm. I, so I'll push back a little bit. Sure. I don't think a rabbi would ever have made that statement. Okay. Because I, the, the sort of having your cake and eating it too issue is, mm -hmm. on the one hand, the I am, mm -hmm. right, as you said, yes. that this is a path to salvation and to relationship with God through the person, yes, and then in the next breath, uncouple it from the person and say it's really about the way. Yes, right, right. And that th there's a certain right. there's a certain tension there, that especially isn't easy when you have the I am, which connects to right, right. Uh, to the, right. the tradition. Right. Of, of so I'm not saying it's not. God. I'm not saying the language isn't d doesn't have resonance. echoes to it, sure, resonance sure. to it. Right. But I I think that for many Jews the issue is there specifically is the interposition of the personal. Right. Um, right. It, frankly, the statement wouldn't have its power if the I were if the I am was, were changed to this is. True. True. Right. So so th this is the way, the light, and the truth. I could yes. hear all sorts of rabbis saying that. Sure. Right. But I think. But to embody it and to personalize is Christian it as, distinctiveness. Is Christian distinctiveness. Exactly right. Which which takes us even to the point of saying, you know, we read scripture through Jesus mm -hmm. all, all together. Mm -hmm. So when we think interpretively, we do think of his embodying the fullness of uh, God's will in his personhood mm -hmm. so that then he becomes 
and and sometimes we can of course use him for our own purposes and say well this you know Jesus would want this or would right, want right, that right. right but it it does become an interpretive principle for us that for example if he forgives his enemies and says we love we should love our enemies uh, and do good to them that hurt us, and he does so from the cross, then we have to interpret any other claims of fighting against our enemies right. and, and, and mitigate those biblically because Jesus has superseded them in, in a different way, not, I mean, but, but in terms morally and spiritually, and we go with Jesus' words. Right, and I would sense. say, to go back to the sort of hermeneutic question, part of the unique power of Christianity mm -hmm. is the, the notion of ethic drawn from personal example. Right, right. And the contrast between that and a bunch of thou shalts and thou shalt nots mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is striking. Yes. And winning. Yes, yes. And the, the, and I'm not saying somebody cooked it up in a chemistry set, but I, I'm definitely not saying that. But it is genius mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to root ethic in personal narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense then right. to say, what is this paltry verse somewhere nested among a bunch of other verses? Mm -hmm. And here is the story. Right, right. Here is the embodiment of the holy in a human being. Right. How mm -hmm. could there be any doubt about what's going to trump what? Right, right. Well, and, and I think that goes to our claims and conviction about uh, the incarnation right. of God in one human being uh, that uh, is the Son of God. Right. And uh, this is another place of our disagreement or place of departure yep. um, because we, we have a sense that uh, what God did is to follow a trajectory in the course of religious history of moving closer and closer to the world. Mm -hmm. And finally, the, the union of God with the world comes in one person, mm -hmm. but it wasn't uh, arbitrary or accidental. It has its roots in the Shekinah mm -hmm. and uh, the, you know, God sojourning with the people and all these sorts of things and moving closer. Uh, and the spirit and the prophets, etc. But ultimately, it's not just in one person. It is the whole, the shalom of of God, the the the, the future consummation of the union of God with the world is the aspiration that we we long for. But to so focus it on one individual is part of the departure between our face. I think, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, it is the. I think for ancient Israel and for modern Jews, and you and I have talked about this, it is the it is the point of separation more than anything else, which isn't to say that there aren't all, all sorts of other really valuable theological distinctions that make us separate and valued each. But without question, the um, the notion that a human being is divine, right? and that may be clumsy language for it, but the notion that a human being is divine right. is sort of a deal breaker right. Right. in Jewish theology. Sure. One of the most important things you ever said to me though, and I want to make sure to say this as um, addendum to that statement, 25 years ago we were having a similar conversation and we were talking about things that each, of, not just our people, but we were really talking about things that each of us might say that might hurt the other. Right. And I said that the sort of rank and file Jewish understanding of Jesus is that Jesus was a great teacher who brought great goodness and justice and love to the world, um, a great teacher, a fully human being, not divine. And I thought that was like the most magnanimous thing in the world. <laughs> and you told me how hurtful it was to hear. Yeah. And I've never lost that moment. Yeah. Um, that our own confident proclamations, as full-hearted and sensitive as we think they are, right. um, can still cause pain and real deep religious pain to another human being. Hmm. Interesting. 
Well, you know, this is an example, I think, of what we have gone through in all these years of friendship and how it has sharpened us. Uh, it has made us better at what we do, I hope, more sensitive, more compassionate. And uh, David, it's been a rich three decades together mm. working alongside, and I thank you for your friendship and for all that you do in our community and for the cause of God in the world. And amen, and thank you for good God and for all the good work you do, and I look forward to our continuing to do it together. Great. Thanks so much, friend. See you, man. Okay.